Welcome to this evening's Talking Together event. Uh, so this is led by the IMAC key and it's in collaboration with the Royal Aeronautical Society and the IET. And Talking Together is an event that we've uh, we've been doing for, since 2019. It's all about getting multiple perspectives on the universal issue of mental health and wellbeing. And 10th of October was World Mental Health Awareness Day. And so this is a fantastic chance for us to acknowledge that. And being able to collaborate with Teach First is excellent one of the largest educational organisations in the country. Um, and as a, as a professional institution that is STEM related, Teach First plays a massive role in providing STEM teachers to disadvantaged schools mainly. Uh, and you, know, you play a massive role in, in providing amazing teachers that can educate the next generation of, of engineers. So we definitely you know, want to talk to you about these different topics. And mental health and wellbeing is one we, we say we've been exploring for the last few years in, in depth. So thank you very much, first of all, Nathan and, and Russell for joining and thanks to all our guests on the line it's great to see so many of you on, on a live webinar um, and I hope you hope you enjoy the conversation. So to begin my, my name is Joshua Thompson-Smith I'm on the I'm a key young members board and I lead this event and I've also got with me tonight Armit Palmer he's also on the I'm a key uh, local committee and he's a Rolls-Royce uh, engineering apprentice and I'm a Rolls-Royce engineer myself. Um, so tonight we've got two fantastic people with us. So I think I'm going to pass over to Russell first. And the first question is, what is your background? Um, and what does a day as a CEO look like at Teach First? Uh, well, look, thank you for inviting me. It's lovely to be here. And I'm looking forward to the conversation. It's such an important topic for us to be discussing. Um, so I'm, I'm Russell. I'm Chief Executive of Teach First. I've been doing that for four years uh, now. I have an interesting career path, I think, up until that point. I, I started um, in software sales. Uh, I swiftly, because I didn't really enjoy selling things, I swiftly moved on to management consulting, where I spent a decade or more in, in management consultancy. Uh, and then in the strangest career shift of all time, I think uh, I switched to the trade union uh, movement, where I was general secretary of the National Association of Head Teachers for seven years. Um, now, that isn't the world's most radical uh, union, um, representing mainly primary um, head teachers, a good selection of secondary ones as well. But, you know, we had some interesting times in the Michael Gove um, era there. My, um, my, my sort of track record is that I'm the first general secretary to lead my union out on strike uh, for the first time in our 120 years of history. So those are my radical credentials uh, for you. Uh, uh, four years ago, I made the shift um, to teach first uh, when I was representing head teachers. Um, the one thing that they all said to me was that getting the best people in our country to join teaching, many of whom already do, but we want more of them uh, as well, and making sure that they can thrive is the single, one of the single greatest concerns that they have. And uh, I thought and, and believe that Teach First is at the heart of that. So um, that's my background. Excellent. Good to hear. Um, so same goes um, for yourself, Nathan. Um, what's it like being a teacher? Understand, Ambassador. Um, yeah, uh, again, I'd, I'd like to well, uh, echo the thanks for um, having me um, on board tonight. Really looking forward to it. Um, so, yeah, I'm uh, Nathan Delaye, and I am assistant ed teacher and also a maths teacher at Lettle High School in, in uh, Manchester. And I, again, I probably didn't have a, a typical route into what I'm doing now. Um, before, before going into teaching, I was actually a professional footballer. Um, I had to retire at the tender age of 24 due to uh, 23 due to illness and then went to retrain did my degree and then joined the teach first leadership development program um taught maths at school in bradford and now i teach um at loretto in in charlton and um last couple of years i've been assistant head teacher as well um that is a, a challenging role um but definitely the passion and um, my main passion and the most enjoyment that i get of any typical day is when i'm actually in the classroom and teaching the kids um, my current role, um, the leadership responsibility that I've undertaken, it means that for uh, large parts of the time, I am actually away from the classroom dealing with management and leadership um, and strategy meetings, etc. But definitely the joy and the passion that I have is when I'm in front of the, the students and the high school students teaching them maths. Um, so, yeah, my day is um, the joy in my day is in the classroom, but it's with um, a number of other things as well. Sounds like a good balance. Really interesting. Yeah. When, I, when I was, at, thank you both. Yeah, it's really interesting to get your backgrounds uh, as we go through the conversation. I was thinking, Nathan, that when I was uh, at school, you kind of look at maths teachers and I was like stressed and think, oh, 
while this is stress, you know, teaching, you know, what was that so stressful? But now being in industry, I think in my job's probably nowhere near as stressful as theirs. So I think one of our first questions we thought of was, what do you do on a daily basis um, to protect your mental health and well-being, or keep a positive mindset while you're in the work workplace? Okay, well, what um what I seem to do is I was uh, kind of thinking about this, and it's it's true in everything that I do. Um, a lot of the things that I do in my day to day um, are things that, you know, aren't necessarily top of the, my most favorite things to do. But before I start any task, um, any task that needs considered thinking or, or, or mental kind of concentration, I always do something that puts a smile on my face. I know I'm lucky in the in the kind of profession I'm in, I get all of my joy from the students. So I would literally, if I have a meeting or an important meeting, what I will do first without fail is I'll have a walk around the school and I will have a chat and I'll have a laugh and joke with the students. And that immediately makes the task that I'm just about to do seem more manageable and better, more approachable. So it's almost like, instead of kind of thinking, oh, I need to start, I need to start, it's taking that step away, doing something that, that makes me smile, which a lot of the time is just having a laugh and a joke and an interaction with the varied group of people who I have the pleasure to work with. I get that joy and it just makes everything seem better. So it's kind of that stepping away before you launch straight back in. Yeah, really interesting. That sounds quite interesting, yeah, definitely. Um, would you say... Um, yeah, say, Army, what does, does Russell, uh, what do you do on a daily basis out of interest? My job isn't as stressful as Nathan's. Uh, I have to say, he's on the front line in the middle of a, uh, through the pandemic, uh, helping hold all of that together. Um, I think that's, it's really important to, to note that you know, there are people for whom stress is, am I going to be able to feed my family when I get home from work uh, as well? So for some of us, it, it doesn't hurt, I think, sometimes for me to remind myself that I'm in a pretty privileged uh, position with some level of control over my own destiny uh, as well. But of course, I feel the pressure. Um, I've got lots of people in the organization for whose, you know, the success of it, um, uh, they, de they depend on the decisions that are being made. I think it's a version of, of Nathan's um, strategy, but at the other end of the, the, the event, uh, which is when I go home, knowing that I, could, that I must switch off from work at some point. And obviously there's things I want to chew over and think about, but there comes a time when you've got to be able to switch off and focus on something else, your family, your hobbies, your faith, whatever it might be uh, for you. And when I, when I look at successful leaders and managers across, the, across any sector, the ones that, that sustain their performance over the long time, they have a life outside of work. However pressured it is, there's a time when they can think of something else. And when I see people cracking under pressure, um, it is often because they live pressure 24 hours a day. They, you know, they wake up thinking about it. They go to bed thinking about it as well. And their problems, they, the scale of the problems morphs as a result of that. And I think if you can step away and do something else. So uh, after today, before I went on this call, I'm trying to lay some tiles um, uh, in one of my rooms. I was off. I've got a new tile saw. So I was off doing that. Uh, it cleared my head completely. And I'm in a much better mood now joining this call. Excellent. Um, I, I think the second question should be, um, do you think there's an open environment in schools um, for students to you know, talk about mental health, their well-being and, and gen general you know, well-being to do around that? I, I, th I think there definitely, um, there definitely is and, and that has increased and I think there's, um, you know, we can look at why it's increased and we can look at it in terms of cause and effect. One thing that I did notice post, I know we're still in the pandemic, but um, when students returned after prolonged periods um, of time being off, their mental health did suffer and it really did. And we found we had, we had a record number of students accessing our counselling provision and, and we had, there was a need where teachers were actually almost being the counsellors for them. And we did realise that we needed to put something in place. And this isn't just at, at my school, this is a, um, speaking to my colleagues at different schools, things like well-being groups and clubs have been set up, not just for students, actually for teachers as well, because it's important that, you know, as, as members of staff overseeing these young people, that we look after our mental, uh, mental health as well. So I would say that there's definitely been an increased provision in school and an increased focus on that. 
And then the question that I kind of was reflecting on myself was, are we being, were we, sorry, being reactory or, or did we already have it in place? And I definitely think we could have done more. We definitely could have done more kind of, you know, we, we do a lot and, and teachers do a lot. It's not just about, you know, teaching students how to count, et cetera. Um, but definitely when the need, when the need arose, we put more in place. And I think now these open and honest conversations, they are, it's, it's the norm now for people to admit that they need help. Or, and that's that can only be a good thing. Definitely, yeah. yeah. I think, you know, we learned something very important during lockdown about the role that schools play in young people's mental health uh, and indeed the wider community as well. Firstly, we, we saw how much we depended on schools for staying in touch with families. And although um, lots of children weren't able to come into schools, schools were reaching out. Uh, on, on multiple occasions and helping families navigate um, these these difficulties and indeed some of the problem was not being able to see the children as often as you as you would but also uh, and of course not every young person thrives in school or in the institutional environment and not every school gets it right although many people do but just how much children missed being at school not not just the teaching although I think you know that's really important but as, as Nathan has described that broader social setting of having some adults who know you and care for you uh, and your friends uh, as well and that social side of mental health uh, and the ability the bonds that we have which have been you know strained by the lockdown i think something that 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 really emerged to me as something I, I would have underestimated in the past it's interesting i was saying only saying to Armin the, the other day i left school like 10 years ago it seems a long time ago to me, but it's still quite in modern history, if you like. And it definitely wasn't at the top of the agenda. Mental health and well-being as a student wasn't at the top of the agenda, and that's only 10 years ago. So I, you know, looking at things on social media, looking at LinkedIn, uh, speaking to you know, friends and family, it seems that education is definitely putting up the agenda as is the STEM industry. So it's, it's really positive to, to think about that. Um, and I think it brings us to the, to the next question. It's something we always ask all of our guests. Um, and it's about imposter syndrome. So we've got some apprentices and grads on the line um, who have just started Rolls Royce, for example. And I've definitely experienced that as I started my career. I don't, I can't say I experienced it that much in school myself, but I know some students would. But definitely in the professional life, when you started, it was like, oh my, you know, wow, I've just entered a room here. I definitely don't feel like I belong in it. Um, and that can really take a toll on you. And you think, oh, do I deserve this job? Do I think I should be here? Uh, so we're, we're asking you, know, you two, have you ever felt imposter syndrome? Did you ever, ever experience it either at school or in your young professional life? And uh, what kind of encouraged you to, to think differently about that, that emotion? Um, well, I, I, I certainly did feel it and it is something that I overcame. I'm, I'm very, well, not fortunate because I do believe that I have worked hard, but, you know, I was... I was made assistant head teacher after after only being in the profession for um, six or seven years. So it was quite a quick rise to get there. And I remember when I was first, when I was appointed as assistant head teacher, I remember it being a, an internal interview and I was up against other colleagues who had been teaching for twice as long as me and had been in a middle leadership position for a lot longer than I had been. And then when I was appointed, I remember I remember thinking that, you know, am I am I the right person who should be doing this? Um, but then what I quickly realised is that, you know, we need to do, we need to have faith in our own ability, and and you wouldn't be in the position that you were in, whatever stage you are, you wouldn't be in the position that you were in if people didn't see the potential in you, and they didn't, um, you know, they didn't really really value you. Talk, there's a there's a lot of talk at the moment about um, diverse leadership. Um, you know, not necessarily just in terms of, um, you know, uh, ethnicity or, or but, but also diversity in, in, in age and ex levels of experience and people bring different things to the table. And a lot of innovation comes from having that diversity around you. And I think, you know, that's what ultimately I used to reflect on that I might not be the same as the other assistant head teachers that I, you know, I see around me, but that's a benefit. That's that's a positive. 
I think everybody feels imposter syndrome from time to time. I certainly did, and I still do from time to time when I'm walking in, you know, getting involved in a new place or a new uh, endeavor as well. And I think it helps to remember that, that however confident and sorted people are able to project uh, that, and some people are very good at projecting that, that feeling of confidence, almost everybody is wondering how they measure up to the room that they're in or to the job that they have uh, as well. Uh, and I think it, um, it, it really helps to, to, to know that, that there are no perfect professionals or leaders uh, and managers, that everybody is, is kind of figuring it out as they go along. Everybody has mistakes in their past that they, uh, that they dwell on and think about, uh, but that, that's, true, that's true for everybody. Uh, as Nathan said, you were, you were selected for a reason. You put yourself forward for a reason as well. You thought you might have some potential here uh, as well. And every time that I've sort of joined a room of people where I'm, I'm worried about what they think of me or, or how much better they are, if I spend some time listening, thinking and learning from them, I, I soon realize that I do have something to contribute. And I believe everybody has something to contribute. Don't try and be like them, try and be like yourself and the things that you bring to it and you will have a perspective. Um, and if you're working hard and learning, you will, you will, you will have earned your place in any particular room. Okay. I, I, I can say for myself, as soon as I joined Rolls Royce, I felt a little bit of that. And, you know, every placement I moved to, I, I, I do feel a little bit like that. Um, but, you know, gradually, as, you know, as I get used to it, and, you know, as I overcome it, it gets better with time and time again. Um, so moving on to the next question, um, at any point in your careers, did you feel uncertain um, about, you know, what, what the future you know, holds? That's, that's an interesting one. It's also an interesting one for me to answer because, as I mentioned before, um, you know, I, I used to play professional football and I remember my kind of downfall of that is I was constantly injured. As much as I'd, you know, have faith and confidence in my ability, I'd spend far too long on the treatment table. And before I actually did stop playing, I remember, I remember to myself thinking, you know, is this the right career path for me? Do I need to do something else? Obviously, I made the switch then into teaching. And, and when I first started, I then still had some uncertainty because I was finding my feet. I was, things were more challenging than, than obviously they are now. And it did make me um, consider if I was going down the right path. But again, it's kind of on similar thing, themes to what we've said already. It's just about having that confidence, that belief, and giving it a bit of time being kind to yourself in realizing as well that you're not going to get things right first time and that the way that you move forward with anything is you learn by your mistakes and if you don't put yourself out there to be in a position to make those mistakes you won't learn from it and ultimately you won't um get that confidence and be in that um sure more sure position career-wise i i, I tend to find that my job is almost entirely defined by uncertainty uh, at this point um, uh, in time, that given the role that I do, all of the straightforward decisions have been made before they get to me. Uh, if, there's a, if there's a clear quantitative answer for why we should do it, other people have made those decisions. The only things that get escalated to my level are the ambiguous, uncertain ones. And uh, I often sort of joke that my job is not to decide between good and bad, uh, it's to decide between good and better or bad and worse. I, I'm never, I never have those black and white decisions. Uh, and it's almost more painful dropping one good thing to do an even better thing than it is to, to do the other way around as well. And I hate sacrificing opportunity. So uh, uncertainty is the name of the game. I am never sure, by and large, whether I'm making the right decision at that time. And I think the worst thing to do is to freeze up and to try and seek more certainty, because however much data you gather, outside of clearly well-defined areas in the nature of the work that I do, that the data, there'll always be a gap there. There'll always be a level of uncertainty. So you go with your, your instinct and your best available evidence that you have. And then exactly as Nathan described, you, you, you sit there and you, you, you watch very carefully to see whether you were right. Uh, and you have to be very good, at, uh, very humble about saying that was the wrong call. Uh, it seemed good at the time and I, I don't beat myself up about it, but it's like, no, it's to never that, that was the wrong call. Um, so you um, you change your mind uh, or do something different. Um, and it's usually better to have made a decision than to have made no decision at all. Uh, it's, it's not freezing that I think is the key in the face of uncertainty. 
Yeah, really interesting. It's one of the key themes that underpinned our Talking Together series, especially last year. And we asked all of our um, guests that question. Uh, and I think everyone was kind of saying, you know, almost you have to kind of learn to thrive in uncertainty as well, because it's an emotion you can't get away from. It's always going to be there. And COVID showed that, didn't it? COVID-19 was the uh, perfect example of how we all had to live in uncertainty. And one thing that's very closely linked to that is disappointment, obviously, and disappointment in the way things go and, you know, whether it's educational level when you're at school. I remember being disappointed just because I missed two marks. I remember disappointed because I, I missed out on my first choice uni because of, of an exam paper right up to the professional level. Um, uh, and a big question we always ask, I guess, is how do you deal with disappointment specifically uh, in the professional space? How do you approach that? Yeah, it's a again, it's 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 an interesting one that, and it, it's quite a tough one. It, it's very hard, and what I do think you've got to do is is try and look um, for the positives. Yes, you're going to be disappointed, and I've had many disappointments um, in in my um, ed educational career, my teaching career, and and um, before that as well. But you need to look at each disappointment as a new opportunity. Um, and I know it's a bit cliche to say that, but I do I do really believe it. Like the paths that we take in, in life, it's not going to be a smooth, easy road and there'll be different diversions, but ultimately we'll get to that place where, we, where we're happy and confident. And I always reflect on my past and kind of my highlights um, in my previous profession and there were many of them. But then when I think about my, and, and the disappointment that I had actually when I had to stop playing football, but then when I kind of think now I'm doing a job that I love and I, I love nothing more than, um, you know, seeing a group of students who I've worked with for five years open the GCSE results. And then rather than getting hung up and caught up on my previous professional career, I've actually used that initial disappointment as a as a kind of motivation and and a, a door opening for a new pathway um so it is trying to stay positive and and and, and trying to trying to um you know take something out of every situation any any career spent doing important and difficult things is going to contain disappointment uh, in it if you've not there's not a few things that you haven't fallen short of i don't know if you're pushing yourself uh, to your full potential how will you ever know what your full potential is uh, and until so you've you've reached that that limit so um one of the things is to take it as a very positive indicator obviously you don't want to fall, fail or, or have disappointments more than you need to uh, as well but if it's completely absent in your life then i'm just i'm just wondering you know whether you know whether you need to be more ambitious on that uh, on that front I, I doubt that it is absent in most people's lives because life is hard enough uh, as it is, uh, the thing to do, um, again, is to keep it all in perspective. You cannot be defined by a single failure uh, or upset within your career. St again, step out of the, the, the present moment and think about the things that have gone well, as well as the mistakes that have been made. Um, in a few years' time, we'll look back on this, and it just won't have that same perspective to you. The kind of things that I felt so intensely at the time and think, like, I've got to stop, I've got to resign, this is the, you know, I'm not capable of doing my job. A couple of years later, I barely remember them uh, at all. Um, hopefully I've internalized a few lessons uh, from it. But again, it's that sense of perspective that you need, that if you stay too close to your problems, uh, as Nathan said, you won't be able to turn them off and say, that was the past, it's all a new day uh, now, and I'm not defined by what happened there. I guess leading on from that question, um, this is something that I haven't really experienced much of, but have you ever considered taking a step down to protect your mental health? Um, and if not, what encouraged you to, to keep on going? Um, I'd, I'd, I'd probably echo what you just said. Uh, personally, I haven't yet, but working with um, people um, in a school, that have, it's happened quite a lot. Like um, when, I, when I was appointed head of maths, the person who was previously head of maths um, took a step down for family reasons, um, you know, wanted to spend more time with family, etc. That's quite common in school and we often have people either um, relinquish some of the roles or drop to part times. And, and I think it's really important that schools and, and other organisations really support that and, and really allow people to make those decisions and still work in the, in the organisation. It's something that I would consider down the line but um i have not had to do that um just yet It'd be interesting to take russell's um, perspective on that 
No, I've not had to or wanted to so far. Uh, but what I have done uh, to a degree, as Nathan has done, is exact across sectors uh, as well. When I, I feel like I've learned what I can or contributed what I can, I've, I've made some shifts uh, across. And I think one of the key lessons for any young person starting their career today is just to, but again, put in perspective how long a career you may have. Uh, ahead of you. You could easily be working for 50 years, uh, given extenses in life expectancy and, and healthy life expectancy uh, as well. Um, there is room to do everything that you want to do within there, and it shouldn't be a linear trajectory. I, I think we should be very comfortable with, with peaks and troughs within this, that there will be times in our lives when we have to devote ourselves more thoroughly to things outside of work, uh, than things inside work uh, and you know being able to move away from a linear career trajectory I think will be helpful I, I look ahead again to a time at the moment I feel like I can do my responsibilities there will come a time in my career when it's like being on the, the sort of the frontline accountability is not something I want uh, anymore I want to, to to step back into more advisory roles those options are, are potentially there uh, at the moment uh, my ambition keeps me moving on and I'm enjoying the the accountability that I have it's uh, Russell, what you said there was interesting because I've, I've been able to listen into all of these interviews we've done and we've interviewed a range of executives uh, across the industry, uh, CEOs as well. Um, and they've all said the same thing as you that a career isn't five years after university, it's, it's, it's a long time and uh, your perspective shifts and changes as you go through that career. Uh, and it's hard. I mean, even, you know, I sometimes think, oh, God, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? You just sometimes it's you have to stop and say, right. How can, how can I enjoy what I'm doing right now? Because otherwise you just, well, you meet yourself coming backwards, I think is the saying, isn't it? Um, <laughs> you don't look after yourself. So yeah. I wish I'd known that. I wish I'd known that when I was graduating uh, as well. I thought I had to rush my way through as fast as yeah. I possibly could. And if I wasn't moving up the ladder, um, then there was something wrong uh, with me. And I was comparing myself to my peers and how well they were, were doing. If I'd known, you know, it's, it's nearly 30 years now since I graduated there was space to do everything that I wanted to do and if, exactly as you said if I've been able to spend more time just like what does it mean to be good at what I am doing now uh, and how can I enjoy that then uh, the next step I would have had a, a secure foundations I mean it's worked fine for me I'm happy with what it is but I think that's that sense of relaxing just a little bit enjoying the moment uh, and being being there for your responsibilities at the moment not looking at always looking ahead to the next step i think that could take some of the stress out of life as well mm. and there's some great questions in the chat we'll come back to in a bit i think some of this kind of aligning with that you know our society is very like you've got to you've got to run run in your career as quickly as you can and it it's not always the best thing for your mental health and well-being uh so on that uh, that note both of you nathan and russell you're in um in the education sector and in your respective positions nathan you're you know a senior leader in your school Russell, you're the senior leader in this charity organisation that's Teach First. So what can you do as senior leaders in your respective roles uh, to influence the mental health of those in your, your areas, whether that's a school, whether that's an organisation? It's always an interesting question we ask. Uh, I think one thing that I try and do, um, and, and not try, I, I think I do do it quite well, is I do um, outwardly uh remain positive and i think it's important that people it's like the students when i'm teaching in a classroom the students look to me and they get their vibe and their energy from me as a teacher and i'm quite um animated in that and i'm very positive and it's really important to be positive and not be negative and then i kind of apply that same thing to when i'm leading teachers and different heads of department and teaching staff um I do need to stay positive. I do need to um, lead by example, and I think by doing that, it does it does help people. It does help if if I'm if if I moan or I complain. And don't get me wrong, sometimes there are things that I do want to moan and complain about. But I think it's important that as a leader, you you kind of re reshape any conversation like that, um, and 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 I try and I consciously you know, look after myself physically and, and mentally. And just by showing and, and talking about how I do that with people, um, it just kind of sets the precedent, really. I think role modeling 
of, as a leader is, is absolutely crucial in that. Again, role modeling your own work-life balance uh, as well. If you're busy sending emails at 10 o'clock at night or over the weekend, then people are going to assume, uh, assume that. If you never seem to take holiday, then people are going to assume that's how you get ahead inside the organization as well. So that's that's important. Of course, by doing looking after your own well-being and mental health, you, you are in a stronger position to be there for other people uh, as well. One of the things that I think is, is absolutely crucial um, as well, and I sort of I touched on this earlier, is trying to give people more control over their working lives and, and, and what they do. That the sense of lack of control of being pushed by forces that are uh, beyond you is, is a major source of stress uh, in life. And particularly, I think, being held accountable for things that you have no control over. Um, and it's just luck or chance that, that drives that. And I think that's something that many people in school can feel, actually. They're held accountable for their exam results, but actually that can fluctuate um, depending on the prior attainment of the people who are coming in um, to the school. So I do try, and I, I wouldn't claim to be perfect at this, uh, at all, but do try and, and, and be much clearer about it's, it's the stuff that's in, in your control that you're responsible for. Uh, and um, also to, to try and give us maximum trust in people as well, that, that you should determine how you go about your job and, and do things. And I know there are ways that we can be better um, at it, but I think that does help to contribute to that. I don't think that you should, as a leader, create a toxic environment and then invest in sort of catch up or well being interventions um, to somehow mitigate that, that effect, you can have your prime impact on uh, well-being by, by creating a good culture within the organization. Um, I think it also helps if you pay a fair wage uh, as well for people, because that's another major source of stress in life if people cannot support their families or have to hold down multiple jobs for that. So uh, there's a lot of background stuff that you, that you can do um, that, that I think is important. Um, I definitely agree with that. I'm um, following on from that. Yes. Um, why do you think STEM subjects are seen as stressful and impactful to, you know, students, you know, mental, you know, mental well-being? Because certainly when I was, you know, picking my options from GCSE to college, I definitely, you know, that definitely had a way in, you know, with STEM subjects being a lot more harder. I, I, th I think there's, there is there is the stigma, on it, and I, I agree, there is a stigma that there are the more challenging or you should only kind of go down particular routes if you're super academic and and... I think as, as probably as, as we look at the, the, the need to be skilled as well as just, um, you know, able on paper, um, I don't think that's necessarily true. I think it's something that is definitely still there and, and it's, it's very difficult to think how exactly it's, it's going to shift. Um, you know, we can look at what the requirements are from a kind of... Um, policy and and then and curriculum level look at look at the the demands that are being placed within these subjects and look at how relevant certain things are and how applicable they are um for the industries that you might go into after that but i mean it is it is true it's definitely true um and and they are you know, don't get me wrong some of the the stem subjects are quite demanding um subjects but i think as we as there is a, a shift in the different options and the different routes, and you know, we were talking before about um, the, the the pros of apprenticeships and work placements to actually get skills, I think that's important, and I think that will eventually um, support in 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 the plight to kind of change that perception. I have a theory, and I don't know if this is true uh, or not, but I'll see if it if it resonates at all in terms of content, uh, sort of building on what Nathan uh, has said there, that I think there are two different sorts of subjects that we can learn. There's a sort of hierarchical set of subjects where the learning at one stage depends fundamentally on what you've learned at an earlier stage. And there's sort of more linear subjects where you can, if you've missed out on earlier phases, you can still get to grips with that. So if, for example, you're studying mathematics, and Nathan, you can correct me uh, on this one, if you haven't got some of the foundational concepts already secure and fluent, then the rest of the, the stuff that you learn is going to be complete gibberish to you later on. Whereas if, say, in English literature, you, you've missed one book, you can still read another book and engage with that book in a, in a fashion. And so I think one of the reasons why I think some people have a 
sort of negative attitude towards some, uh, and I think a lot of the STEM subjects fall into that hierarchical category, is that they if they have missed out something because um, it hasn't been taught as well as it should, or they've missed some time at school, suddenly they're sitting in a lesson where all of the dialogue is almost in another language for them, and they get very alienated from that, and that is very stressful. Whereas I think in, in some of the humanities subjects, you can catch, get dip, dip back in and bring your outside knowledge to it. And I wonder if that's one of the reasons why we have different, sometimes different attitudes to the two sorts of uh, subjects. And, and what that suggests is that um, in, in those subjects in particular, it's really important to make sure you have secure foundations before you move on to each stage and that we shouldn't be rushing through them. We should be thinking, let's get the basics right. And then we build the next, because some of these subjects are, are towers built on, on previous layers. Uh, I don't know, Nathan, is that, am I, am I making that up or is there something no. in that? <laughs> no, it's, it, it's very true. And it's, it's, I think it's fundamentally at the heart of, of why um, they, they are challenging subjects to, to learn and, and to, uh, you know, to teach as well. And there is that accumulation of knowledge that is important in, in particular areas, particularly in, in STEM subjects that isn't necessarily the case in other, in other areas. And um, so no, I'd agree with exactly what you were saying. I think my, I, you know, I did a mechanical engineering masters. So I had with my peers at university, dark days in third year doing advanced mathematics, um, where, if you didn't know the stuff you did four or five years ago, you had no chance. You had absolutely no chance of being able to write this thesis on a specific principle. And uh, yeah, I remember going to the, the, the professor at the time and with a group of them, we were like, we literally don't have a clue. <laughs> we don't have a clue, sit us down, talk us through it. And it was amazing. Once you've gone back three, four years to, you know, what we did in like first year, um, you realise, right, you know, and actually you're getting yourself worked up, impacting your mental health and well-being when actually the answer was a lot easier. Um, and that's why STEM subjects, I know they're hard. I always say to them, Armit, we're only talking about this. Um, they're difficult, but it doesn't mean that you can't be successful in the STEM industry uh, just because they're hard at school. Because they, they are definitely a hard subject, no doubt. Um, and I think I saw someone put in the chat about languages. I actually did French um, at GCC in first year of A-level, and I found that as hard as STEM subjects as well, because it's a similar kind of thing, isn't it? You don't know the basics you're going to struggle all the way through your language uh, qualifications. So re really interesting. Um, I think that kind of segues nicely into our next question, which is Teach First, you're an amazing organisation that works with disadvantaged schools specifically. I was doing a lot of reading about, about your mission. Um, and it's, I've actually, as part of Rolls-Royce, I've done STEM events in collaboration with yourselves as well, where you have a disadvantaged school come, come along and look at Rolls-Royce as an organisation and, and, and get people to talk to them. Uh, and they're all doing STEM subjects like every other school in the country. And thinking about those, those schools that are from disadvantaged backgrounds, do you think they have the same support networks for mental health and wellbeing available to, to other schools in the country? Uh, well, I mean, Nathan is working in the, the heart of one of those, so he will, he will be able to talk um, uh, more informed about that. But I do think that Unfortunately, in, and more generally speaking, um, unfortunately in our country, those schools who serve the poorer or more disadvantaged and deprived communities are less likely to have the things they need to thrive uh, as, as schools. Uh, they're less likely to have the funding that they require. They're less likely to have networks from outside of education that they can rely on. They are less likely to get people who are qualified at degree level in the subject that they are teaching to GCSE and A level. You name it, our system is rigged against these schools um, uh, as well, which is then why the young people who come from these schools, despite the fact that their talent is equal to anyone in any school, public or private in this country, just haven't had the level of investment that they require to compete on a level playing field. And, and our, our mission as a charity is to reverse that. We think that the, the schools um, who serve the most disadvantaged communities should be the best resourced, best supplied, best staffed, most celebrated schools that we have in, the, in our country. Uh, I think, you know, I'd love to see them get more money. I'd love to see them have the connections to employers. And I know that Rolls-Royce, for example, does support lots of these local schools. There are some really strong employers who, who do try and write this. But also, I think it begins with teaching uh, as well. That is fundamentally at the heart of school. And I know teachers do so much more than just teach the lessons they care deeply for the, for the pupils. And I think if we can continue to make sure that the 
um, that, that these schools get the, the highest quality teaching and the support for the teachers who are in there, um, then I think we can level level the playing field. And I think that extends to mental health uh, as well, but, but I'm sure Nathan can say more about that. Yeah, I think, I'd, I'd, you know, everything that you said kind of resonates with what I am seeing at school, that we do have, um, you know, I touched on it before, we do have a um, kind of, especially particularly um, as a result of the pandemic, that the students have greater needs and particularly the disadvantaged students. And unfortunately, we don't always have the resources um, available to support them. Um, you know, Teach First, uh, as an example, and it's, it's, it's why I was so passionate about uh, joining Teach First and, and, and joining the mission, really at the forefront of, of trying to get a change in that area, really, and, and, and really lobbying, really, the, the, the policymakers and the government to really um, support us because we do really need the help. You know, it, it really pains me to, to say we have some situations where you know, a lot of disadvantaged students, not exclusively, but are, are crying out for support in our school um, in terms of um, counselling. And, 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 and um, we, we actually don't have enough people trained to support everyone at the same time. And then it just pains me to think that we're having to sometimes make decisions about, oh, who do we, who gets an appointment today? Who do we get to see today? And then who can wait for another day? And, you know, um, Fortunately, there's there's not been any big negative consequence of that, but you can you can imagine you can imagine what what you know possibly might have happened or what could have happened. But again, um, the schools serving disadvantaged communities they need the most support, so it's a no brainer really that we should um, and people higher up than ourselves probably around here should should focus their energy on ensuring that the support is there. I just one link there, Nathan. I was just saying, um, the um, we talked at the start and from a lot of these interviews and wider events I do as well. Um, the best team in an industry or corporate environment is one that has a diverse range of people from a range of backgrounds. There's no point in having ten people in a room that have all been educated at the same level of school. They all come from the same ethnic background, same sexual orientation. It doesn't work. You're not going to get that, you know, that richness of of talent. Um, so. Yeah, it, it all links into that, doesn't it? And, and it's, it's interesting to get your view on it. I don't, I haven't been at school for 10 years, but I know that, as I say, when I was at school, um, it wasn't at the top of the agenda. So in more disadvantaged schools, I'm sure they just didn't have the time or the money at times to support, support these things, which is a real shame. I think following on from that, um, in professional life, it, it's been quite a slow change, you know, to, to enable that to happen. Um, what do you think um, it's like for you know a STEM teacher to you know try and change that around within their industry? Sorry, could you just repeat that question? Sorry. So in terms of professional life, it's been you know quite quite a slow change to incorporate and you know consider mental health and well-being. Um, do you think that'll be as slow as you know for STEM teachers? Um, how do you think that'll impact? Um, I, th I think. I think it probably chimes in 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 line with that as as well. Um, you know, we what I would say in all areas of of education now in in my small kind of microcosm of, of my school, we are really taking a step back. We've we've even even little things like when we talk about um, we've we've considered there's a need essentially for students to catch up on all of the work that they've missed um, as a result of the pandemic but we and I know a lot of other schools we've made a conscious um a conscious uh, attempt to, and, and not just stem teachers but kind of teachers generally to not use that language in front of the kids because if we say you know we need to catch up you need to catch up you need to catch up you're way behind it puts them instantly under uh, uh, under stress it makes them feel inferior it makes them think you know, oh, they're not going to be able to do it. So we've kind of even just a little thing like that. We've tried to change the language just so that we can support students. And yes, there is a need for them to get back up to a certain level, etc. And we would do our utmost to support them in that. But we have reflected, and, and particularly in, again, as we're talking about the cumulative nature of, of STEM subjects, we have consciously decided not to keep referring to them as catch up, catch up, catch up, um, because it's not going to benefit them. We just want to support them in, in the best way that we can. 
Definitely. The debate at the moment, isn't it, is around how we can work harder to recover from this. Let's get let's get more hours in the day. Uh, let's cram more in uh, to that. And I, I do think that's possibly a mistake that can make things worse rather than better. Sometimes slowing down is the right way to achieve achieve your goals. And we have a very hectic school system. There's so much that we want to do and too little time to teach everything that needs to be taught. And whenever something goes wrong in society, I think the first call that we hear, I, when I was at the union, I used to keep a record of all the things that people said, oh, tools, schools must teach this type of stuff. So if there was, uh, if someone, we were worried about swimming, schools must be teaching more swimming. We we're worried about knife crime. We must teach against that. We must teach about teenage pregnancy. And I added it up and you'd have needed 27 hours a day just on education to cover um, all of the topics uh, on this. Um, schools can't solve all of the problems, nor can we do everything within school. Um, sometimes if, if people can have a, a more relaxed and happy childhood where they can you know, spend some proper time learning rather than sort of cramming for the exams, I think we could uh, achieve, achieve a lot more and actually have higher performance at, at the end of it uh, as a result of that. Um, and we were just discussing yesterday, it was interesting they can hear what, hear what you've said on this, we said, what should we teach first be doing for catch up uh, as well? What other interventions should we be making? And one of the heads who was on our board of trustees said, actually, the best thing you can do is leave me alone uh, for a bit uh, on this one. We just need to focus as a school. We need to reestablish our routines, get back to normal. Just help me be a good school uh, as well, rather than doing extra. So again, it's, it's like support teachers, help develop teachers, support leaders to be good, get the networks that they need. Um, so it's, it's pretty much more of what we were trying to do beforehand, but just making sure it goes to the right places. Definitely, just going off what Nathan said, I, I, I think that's quite positive to hear. Um, so I can definitely vouch that. When I was in school, as soon as I missed a day or so, that was it, you know, you, you'd feel like you were completely buried. So that, that's quite positive to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, uh, I think our next question is interesting. It kind of ties in a little bit around STEM subjects in general. Uh, we've talked about they can be stressful. They're certainly hard. Everyone knows they're difficult. Um, and I think at school, Nathan and Russia, you probably agree, we don't teach jobs at school. We don't teach you how to be a salesperson or an insurance broker or an engineer. You teach skills, fundamental building blocks to make a professional um, to go and do the job that they're going to do in their future life. But STEM subjects have these, you know, these stressful stigmas are attached to, to them. Uh, and I remember getting my A-level and GCC results, you know, and just thinking, oh, well, this is my future, I'm, you know, in this envelope kind of thing. And I did see peers that were uncertain about their futures when they got their results. There was that feelings of loneliness. Well, I can't go to uni now. I can't go and get my apprenticeship. What's, what's going to happen to me? Um, that doesn't always project into the STEM industry later on in life. So what can we do as schools and educational organisations? To not lose a generation of fantastic potential STEM employees later on in life because they've had a bad experience at school with STEM subjects. What, what's your kind of opinions on that? We, we've thought about we've thought a lot about this in schools when we're looking at careers, events, etc. We obviously want students to be very successful, so so we want to firstly promote them that the doing well academically. Um, but then it's also kind of getting it, getting it in there and looking at the different routes so that they, they don't think it's just a one shot. This is your opportunity and then that's it. Um, you know, they need to know that there is opportunity, whether it's in college or later life. If they need to get a particular qualification, they can redo it. We're also looking at other routes. So other entry routes that are, haven't been possibly the ones that we've um, shouted about as much. Um, where you can get those skills and get those qualifications on the go um, and supported because you obviously need to be competent in particular areas to go into certain industries and that's that's a, a, a given um, but it's just to think to think that you know someone's hopes and dreams and ambitions could be um, could be taken away because of a poor performance on a particular day when they sat their um, biology exam or, or physics exam. It isn't right. And, you know, kind of thinking about how we can move away from this kind of one shot um, approach, which was one of the one of the things um, kind of reflecting on the teacher assess grades process when teachers had to award students grades based on um, you know the the evidence that they had at hand, and and we did really look at it as a school, and and we thought this way now we're making these judgments 
on students based on how they've done in the last two or three years, not just on one exam. And we actually found it quite um quite a a, a good and rewarding and a fair way to do it. It's, it's strange, isn't it? Since leaving school, almost nothing in my life was make or break uh, from that. I never get one shot uh, at it. You know, if I if I put a report into the board that isn't very good, they tell me it's not very good and I rewrite it uh, and have another go uh, at it. If I apply for a job and I don't get that job interview, I apply again later on or I find a different company or something like that. So in real life, it's so rare that we would get one shot at things. It's not unheard of, and there are certain roles uh, which those decisions are critical, but for most of us across our career, there's another path to our goal. Uh, and so it does seem strange to me, building on what Nathan said, that we present exams as this make or break uh, time when actually it would be so easy for us to create alternative routes, to allow um, resets, to, to have someone come at this from a different angle, some people are, are very sort of theoretical and academic and learn through that way. Other people will master it through getting involved in the role uh, and they can still end, end up equally good um, at, at the end of it. So uh, I think we should try and sort of get that insight back into school. This isn't your last chance uh, of things. Obviously, give it your best job. It's easier if you get it right first time, you'll be a bit quicker uh, and smoother because we don't want people to not try at all, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, and I, 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 Sometimes it feels like it is to young people, and that's a really sad state of affairs. Definitely. I think following on from that, um, talking about teachers now, um, so, you know, a lot of teachers, you know, which are, you know, the only women, you know, early gay or, you know, from different eth eth ethnic backgrounds, um, do find that, you know, it takes a mental, you know, make, takes a toll on their mental health. Um, what do you think we're doing, you know, as a STEM industry across the board um, to, you know, help improve that and get a more diverse range of teachers? Hmm. It's uh, it's an it's an interesting one, and it's obviously um, being being black myself. I, I I sometimes reflect on who taught me in school, and I didn't have any any um, black teachers at all. And it was all kind of when I think when I grew up thinking of what a maths teacher looked like. That was essentially all all, all I had in my school, and and I do think that um, I do. I, Maybe not as as quick or or as radical as as um as as people might hope, but definitely seeing a change. They're definitely seeing a change in the in the number of people from ethnic minorities, minorities, different sexual orientations who I'm working with currently and who I've been working with and who I know are getting into teaching. And I think kind of the spotlight that's put on it and the positive spotlight that's put on it um is having an impact. Yes. Um, kind of speaking in, in education there's still a long way to go I look at some of the more senior leadership positions um in schools and again whilst whilst there seems to be a lot more um diverse uh, intake of teachers at that senior leadership level it, it's not as as prevalent yet but I am confident that you know we will get there as a society I think that I, we definitely see that in the stats, Nathan, uh, an entry into the profession it is becoming more and more diverse, although still not fully reflective of the young people of this country as well. But it does filter out far too rapidly into leadership roles within schools and the leadership teams of our schools do, are not reflective of the communities they serve on many of the different dimensions um, that we're looking at. And I think, as you, as you say, I think representation matters. I hear that said and I believe it. Uh, as well you need to see people who come from the backgrounds that you do whether that be race or class or um, any other way that you might uh, identify uh, and that proves it's possible for people like you if you're putting yourself in your in a role of a, of a student so we need to do better uh, on this and it's not just about the numbers starting it's the progress through the system um, it is the way people can thrive uh, and how they're, they're treated as they get through that and whether they can aspire to the senior most roles uh, within there as well. We have to get it right at every stage. And I don't think that we do that. I don't think Teach First gets it all right either. There's a lot that we need to improve. So I'm reflecting on ourselves as much as any other um, institution here. But the, if we could do that, it would unlock such a lot of potential. And there, there are many brilliant engineers waiting who have not seen that we would welcome them uh, into that or haven't been given the chances um, that they would 
need to, to get those positions. And that's that's not just unfair to them. It's, it's a huge waste for our country uh, as well if we're not making the most of all the talent that we have. So we would all benefit from getting this right, I think. And it was, it was only last week, even within you know, Rolls-Royce, I heard them talking about it and the Army Key were all very interested to see how your collaboration goes with Mission 44, led by Sir Lewis Hamilton, um, very linked to the Army Key runs Formula students. So that's linked to the Formula One area and, and that's a very underrepresented part of the industry. So you know, fantastic. We're really looking forward to see how that, that um, collaboration goes. And, uh, you know, the target is 150 black STEM teachers, isn't it? And, and that's... It's a start, isn't it? But uh, yes. the IMEC, yeah, we're definitely interested to see how that how that progresses. And if anyone's interested, um, I say we'll, we'll put the links in so you can go and explore that. But it's been all over the news and it's a fantastic spotlight. Uh, so you don't talk about it, it won't. It's not on the agenda, is it? So that's fantastic. And I think that goes quite nicely into our, our final question. We always ask it is, um, what's what's your favourite hobbies to wind down? So one of mine is to watch Formula One. It's to play golf. Um, you know go and watch Arsenal play, even though that can be quite painful. It's got better actually recently, uh, <laughs> to go and watch an Arsenal play recently, but it was quite hard for last year. Um, but yeah, what's your, your favourite hobbies to wind down and step away from the professional environment? Because that's really important for mental health and wellbeing. It's definitely the centre of, of this topic, I would say. Um, yeah, I'll take this one first. So, so something that I've been doing um, recently, well, since I stopped playing football, actually, was I, I've suddenly become a keen cyclist, and I and I feel like when I'm I'm a road cyclist, not not in mountains, but when I'm cycling, I you know I go out and cycle for two three hours, and it's like I'm just it puts me in a good place mentally. I'm thinking about things, I'm reflecting on things, I'm thinking about the next day. But then other times I'm actually just thinking about nothing and I'm just concentrating on the road, I'm cycling and it's just that time. Um, you know, sometimes I go out on my own, but it's just the time when it's it's it seems like I don't have any worries or, or you know, cares in the world to a certain extent and I can just focus on, on me and, and me time. So that's my um, passion at the moment. I've already given away my DIY uh, predilections at the at the start on that. Actually, what sometimes the problem with DIY if it's a very routine activity, you can get trapped in your thoughts rather than thinking about nothing. You've got enough time to stew over problems as well, which isn't always uh, healthy. So exercise is a great is a great one. We should all find a way to put something like that in that is suitable to our needs and our physical state uh, as well. But I do a bit of running. Uh, from from time to time, which I, I find good. And then like many people over uh, lockdown, um, I got a puppy um, uh, six months ago. Uh, he's now the size of a small horse. Uh, so that keeps me pretty busy uh, going on. He's an Alaskan Malamute, if that makes sense um, to everybody. I'm kind of expecting him to have burst in uh, to the room at some point. He's usually interested if he hears me speaking, but he's left me alone. Uh, tonight as well so there's plenty plenty outside of work and I will say it's absolutely essential never give up those commitments however intense the work is there'll be times when you can't give them as much as you want but hold on to something within them because you will need them uh, I think over time I, I think um, just adding on to that Russell I, I quite enjoy DIY myself so just doing something completely opposite to what I'll do in a day-to-day -day role you know just completely you know changes the game and you know just you know it's it's something you, you do for passion and you know you find rewarding in a sense so i, I, I definitely watch for that one i claim to be an engineer and i hate diy so there you go i'll be on the other <laughs> side of the fence <laughs> um, it's interesting your point we recently um interviewed our own ceo warren east um for rolls royce and that's that interview's coming out in the next month and he um he talked about you know ceo it's really important he has a bit of time for himself and he does sailing to do that uh, and you can't think of anything else because if he does and he doesn't concentrate on the sailing, he'll be in the water. So, you know, if anyone can find a hobby or some kind of pastime that just decouples you from your everyday life, uh, it's, it's, it's paramount for your mental health and well-being. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, really interesting. I, I love hearing what people do. So many, all our guests we've had over the, over the last few years, so many different hobbies. Um, it's really, really interesting. So that, that's excellent. Nathan and Russell, thank you so much for taking part. Uh, I think everyone has I've looked at some of the chats that has been popping up. Everyone seems to really appreciate, you know, giving your time to, to, to talk with us tonight. Um, and I think I'm just having a look in the chat. I'm not sure if we've got a couple of minutes, if anyone's, if there are any questions unanswered um, at all, let's have a quick look. I 
I think Russell, you, you answered a few there, which was brilliant. Um, so if, is anyone on the live? If anyone's got any, anything they want to ask, please do chuck it in the chat. I think someone called JJ, JJ said yes. Um, Russell, Nathan, you, are you free for one or two questions? Take one or two questions. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. So, I mean, I don't think I'm a key panel is, is, is able to either unmute those, those people or feel free to ask a question or we can do that ourselves. Ooh, that's quite a long one. Cool. <laughs> what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we will go um, for a question from Nathan. Uh, Nathan in the in the audience is saying uh, any advice for people who want to start teaching. So, uh, well, teach first is one place to start, isn't it? I imagine. <laughs> there are there are lots of good routes into teaching, and you need to find the one that works for you. There are pros and cons um, to each of them. Um, if you're struggling to get, if you're uncertain or struggling to get a foot through the door, volunteer in a local school. Um, do some teaching assistant support work or anything just to get yourself inside a school. Schools are very different these days than they were five, ten years ago, uh, in good ways and in challenging ways as well. So find find out for real. Uh, I think what's um, what's going on. Um, yeah, I, I'd I'd say as well that um, for me that route was teach first and you know it chimed with exactly what I wanted to do but there are lots of different entry routes different lengths of time etc and, and and different different ways you can train um so look out there get be fully researched on the different options um and there will be one that definitely um appeals to you more yeah I'm just going through through some of the there's a question uh, appreciation which is brilliant Love a seeing question that. about um being a role model with a disability um but also mm. about whether salaries are enough if i'm reading that 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 paragraph uh, that i've scanned across firstly i think you know it's great that someone has a deferred offer from teach first we would we would very much wish to be a place where people from all backgrounds can thrive uh, as teachers the starting salary cannot compete with what is on offer in some of the top graduate professions. There's a law firm offering a hundred thousand pounds starting salary here. If that's the main motive, then I think teaching it cannot compete on that, but the learning and experience that you can get from it, which you can take on into other walks of life. So again, this isn't an irrevocable decision. Uh, we, I think you actually, if you give it a try, you may find you love it and can't leave, uh, but very much it is a point that you could move on with some great leadership skills to other, to other things. But I will say, actually, there was a reasonable salary progression if you move up the management layers within a school uh, as well. Uh, and um, you know, it is it is possible uh, if you become a head teacher at a, a reasonable size secondary school to be on a six figure salary uh, as a result of that. Not that it's the be all and end all, but it does demonstrate the fact that there is some good traction um, in there as well. So I wouldn't I wouldn't write off the pay progression that you can get, uh, but you do have to start at the low end, unfortunately. Yeah, you do. And, and, and uh, kind of echoing what Russell said, if you're passionate and enthusiastic about your job, you will um, be given those opportunities to progress. And it, it can happen quite quickly. And particularly for um, people who with a STEM background, um, to be honest, like they're very highly sought after. Um, so there will be opportunities there. That's excellent. I think uh, the, the other thing I want to just highlight on the, on the IMEC East side is that um, in collaboration with the IT, we've actually got an event coming up about being a dyslexic engineer and, and the neurodiversity aspect of mental health and well-being. So look out for the advertisement for that, because whether you're a teacher in STEM, whether you're an engineer, whether you're a, a digital um, pioneer in, in the industry, whatever it might be, neurodiversity plays a big role in, in obviously how you approach those jobs so definitely look out for that event i think uh, i'm really looking forward to being an audience member of that one um you're really good i'm just um going to put in some links into the chat for for the audience members but uh, also we're going we've recorded this video so we will put it on our uh, channel and in the um the bio of the the video we'll also put some links there for people so they can go and explore teach first i'm a key um and hopefully find the information they're looking for so I think uh, at that point, yeah, I want to thank everyone that's joined in. We had a, a great audience um, 
turn up tonight. A range of people have been in there. We've had some great questions. Of, thank you for all the appreciation. This is why we do these events. It's to collaborate, produce a network. Um, and Nathan Russell, the IMEC, wouldn't have interfaced with you um, if we didn't have this series. So thank you so much. Thank you very uh, and much.